Thank you, thank you, and welcome to Women's Conference. Aren't you having a great time this morning? I want to give a shout out to Suzanne, the Assembly Women's Team. I'll get out of y'all's way. <laughs> thank you, thank you. The Assembly Women's Team for putting this together. This is beyond anything we could have imagined, and I'm so excited that we have made it. And to Ashley, to Ashley. <laughs> thank you, thank you for your obedience. What an incredible word, a reminder of God's relentless pursuit of us. And I don't want session two to be separate from session one. I want session two to be a continuation of this story that we're hearing. What is the proper response to a God who has reached for us over and over and over? Our response is also our privilege. Today, we get to reach back. We get to reach back and not let go. I get the privilege to talk to you today about our relentless pursuit of God. No pressure. <laughs> so if you're ready for the word, if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I'll give you a moment to find it, but once you find it, if you'll actually set it aside, just hold on to it for a minute. I want to give you a little bit of context because Hebrews chapter 12 is incredible if you don't know the backstory, but it leaps off the page if you know what's happening. So I want to take us there. I want to set the scene before we read. So Hebrews is in the New Testament, and the book of Hebrews is actually a letter written to a group of people. Do you know who it was written to? The Hebrews. Don't be scared. It's, it's not a trick question. The Hebrews, very good. And Hebrews is not the only letter in the New Testament. There are several. And for example, uh, First and Second Corinthians, these are letters written by Paul to the people of? Look at you go. Very good. But Hebrews is unique to letters like First and Second Corinthians because First and Second Corinthians is written to the people of Corinth. And that audience is like a group of baby believers. Right? There are people who have just converted to Christianity under Paul's ministry, and not long after that, they actually start to have some issues, like some real issues. You should read it sometime. <laughs> real issues, and so Paul already is writing to them saying, hey, no, 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 don't forget what we talked about. This is how we do this. This is what it means to be a Christ follower, and Paul writes in a way that would be easy for a baby believer to understand. He uses words and terminology and phrases and references that they would understand to try and make this connection for them so that they can know what it means to be a Christ follower. But Hebrews, Hebrews is written like a sermon. Right out of the gate, the author of Hebrews is preaching to people. And the author of Hebrews uses references from ancient scripture. He uses references from Genesis. He uses references from Psalm. The ton of the Psalms are found in Hebrews. So you get the idea pretty quick that the audience of the letter of Hebrews, they already know a thing or two about God. They have to have some backstory, and they actually have an ancient history with God. These are no baby believers. These are people who already know God, and if this sermon of Hebrews could be summed up, if it had a title, the title would be, Don't You Dare Give Up Now. Well, wait. Why would they give up? Because at this point, the Hebrews, the specific audience for the letter of Hebrews, these are Jewish Christians. Jewish by birth and now Christians by choice. And actually, fairly recently to the time this letter was written, Jesus had come. He had died on the cross. He had risen again. And he did away with the old sacrificial system that was established under Moses, which the Hebrew people had followed since then. That was the way. But now Jesus had come, and he's done away now with the old sacrificial system. He perfected it. Now he is the way. He's the only way to God, to heaven, to eternity. And this specific audience are the people who have decided to take Jesus at his word, to leave the old system, and follow Jesus. And for that choice, they are facing intense persecution, economically, 
sociologically, and religiously. From the secular side, you've got the government who absolutely has no time for a revolution. And they've boxed them out. Economically, nobody's allowed to do business with the Christians. They're out of the marketplace. They're not allowed in the social settings in their society. And on the other side, their own family. The Jewish people who are not ready to let go of the old way. They're clinging to the system that they've always known. They're not ready for a revolution either, so they've excommunicated the Christians as well. The Jewish Christians aren't allowed in the synagogue anymore, and they're being told, the families are being told to let them go. So you've got this group of people, Christians, right in the middle of intense pressure, and the writer of Hebrews is saying, don't you dare let go. Now, what we know is that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? Against flesh and against blood. Our enemy is one of darkness. It's a spiritual enemy. And more than the secular world, more than the religious world of the day, the enemy of our souls was using this pressure to squeeze them out. Because he knows, think about it, if you can get the group of people who have always known God to let him go, those people over in Corinth, they don't stand a chance. <laughs> the enemy needs this group to fall, and this whole revolution stops here. And so the author writes Hebrews to say, just hang on. Don't relent. And so let's pick up in Hebrews 12, verse 1, with all of that in mind. He says, therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run. Everybody say run. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And now, he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up. The title of my message today is Run for Your Life. I know we already prayed, but would you close your eyes? I want to pray over you. Father, I pray for every woman in this room. Lord, you see her. You know exactly where she is on this race that you have set before her. And I pray, Lord, in the next few moments that you would reignite a fire. Maybe she's never started her race and today's the day. Maybe she's been running for a long time. She can't see the end, and she can't even see a reason why anymore. Lord, I pray that you would breathe fresh life into her soul. That she would feel the call of the Holy Spirit saying, don't you dare give up now. Father, that we would leave this place ready to run with the passion that you deserve. With the boldness to stand in any pressure, any persecution, and know that you are worth it. Lord, it's only by your power that we can do this. So come and have your way today. In your name, amen. Run for your life. Do I have any runners in the room? Anybody run because you genuinely enjoy it? Mm -hmm. No, raise it higher. Don't be scared. Don't be shy. Yeah, yeah. Listen. I respect you, I honor you, I could never be you. And before you say, well, you haven't tried it, I have tried. I have tried, in fact, in the year of our Lord, 2016, <laughs> I made a decision that I was ready to get healthy, I was ready to get uh, active, more active, more than the none that I was at the time. But I knew that I was going to need help. I was going to need a partner. So 
Against my better judgment, I enlisted the help of my very, very best friend. Her name is Madison Ingram. Okay, so if you know Madison, you know why this was a bold move on my part. <laughs> okay, what well, you got to know about Madison is Madison is a unicorn of a person. What's a unicorn of a person? She genuinely just loves things that are healthy, which is concerning. <laughs> she has, like, no concept for the impossible. And I don't think she has any register for pain. <laughs> so I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but walking out of a worship practice one night, I was like, Madison, I know that you're like active and you're healthy and I really want to get, you know, in a better routine. I want to do that for myself. And so would you be my accountability partner? Would you help me, you, you know, just be more active? Her wheels start turning immediately. And I knew this, I was in trouble. So before she can say anything, I was like, why don't I just give some suggestions for what I think would be a good start? Okay, so immediately I'm like, you know, like a, like a, we could do a beginner's Zumba class. We, like beginner, we could, um, you know what, why don't, we could even just do stretching. We could start there. And I was like, you know what, let's not get ahead of ourselves. What if we just start with like meditation? We can just do breath work you know, pace ourselves. And before I can get those words out, she turns to me abruptly and she slams her hands on my shoulders like this. And if you know Madison, you can see it. You can feel it. She goes, dude, I know exactly what we're going to do. It was in that moment I knew I had messed up. I was like, what are we going to do? She said, we're going to run the Los Angeles half marathon. And I tried to say, huh? But I said, why? <laughs> She's like, dude. She had done it before. She's like, it's the most fun experience you'll ever have in your life. You're going to love it. It's totally legit. Like, don't even think about it. Just go home and register. Just go home and register. Don't think about it. I'll find a plan. We'll run together. We start Monday. <laughs> so, I don't know what came over me, but I decided to just go with it. I went home, I registered for the Los Angeles Half Marathon, and she did send me a running plan. You want to know what it was called? It was called Couch to Half Marathon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I have some pictures to show of our experience. So the day she said we'll start Monday, it was like the end of October, so Monday was November 1st and we started running. We followed our plan, and so in December of 2016, I ran my first 5K, and she was here uh, at church for a rehearsal, so my then-boyfriend at the time, Wesley, ran this 5K with me. It was the Jingle Bell Run, and the finish line was right in front of a corn dog stand. <laughs> <sighs> I tell you, for your first race, whatever it takes, okay? So we did the Jingle Bell Run, and then in January of 2017, we ran another race. This one was a little longer. It was like four and a half mile. I don't know. It's all a blur. And uh, so it was a little bit farther. And then in February of 2017, we ran the Sweetheart Run downtown. This was a 10K, okay? This was six miles. And at the time, that was the farthest I'd ever run. But we did it. And then on March 20th, 2017, I completed the Los Angeles Half Marathon with a smile on my face. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you notice I said I completed the Los Angeles Half Marathon, not we completed the Los Angeles Half Marathon. That's because during the Sweetheart Run back in February, we're just, I'm breathing like this and Madison's just chilling. She's like, hey, I, I signed up for the marathon. And I was like, cool. I thought we did that months ago, but okay, cool. And she's like, but I accidentally signed up to do the full marathon and not the half. And I was like, oh, dude, I'm sure we can call them. I'm sure that they'll change it for you. She's like, eh, I think I'll just do it. <laughs> so that day, Madison completed 26.2 miles with honestly no training. A unicorn. I'm telling you what, a unicorn. So we did it. I have run before. And before this experience, I liked Hebrews 12. 
After this experience, I feel Hebrews 12. <laughs> because running is hard. Is there any other metaphor we could use for life? The more I learned about running, and the more I lived life, the more I realized it's a perfect metaphor. Because in November, I knew how to run. If you told me to run or if you were chasing me, or if there were a corn dog stand, I could take off. It's not that I physically couldn't do it. But in November, I would not have been able to run 13.1 miles. Wouldn't have happened. So what happened in the five months from November to March? Because I already knew how to run. What I had to learn was strategy to keep running when it was hard. And that's what Hebrews 12 is all about. He doesn't just say, hey, you guys better run. He lays out strategy for the long haul. And that's what I want to unpack today. Verse 1 says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and run with endurance the race God has set before us. Number one strategy he gives, he's saying, we've got to get rid of some stuff. We'll start with the obvious, the sin. When you sign up for the Los Angeles Half Marathon, it's the only experience I have. I don't know what other races are like. But when you sign up for the Los Angeles, before you can even complete the payment, this window pops up with these rules that you have to agree to. And the first thing in the set of rules is a list of items you are not allowed to bring on the race. Can anybody guess what the first item is that you cannot bring on the race? <laughs> I've heard explosive. I've heard firearms. These are all good guesses, but you're not correct. Energy drinks? It's a good one, but incorrect. Number one on the list is a selfie stick. <laughs> Explosives are on the list. Drugs and alcohol are on the list. Not above selfie stick. <laughs> and it says, for your safety and the safety of all runners, if you bring these to the race, you will not get to participate. Sin is the stuff you can't bring on the race. It's a danger to you. It's a danger to everyone around you. Your sin never only affects yourself. We're running. When you're in a race like that, unless you're number one, which could never be me, there's gonna be thousands of people in front of you. There are thousands of people behind you. There are hundreds of people on every side. You don't have time to trip. That was my biggest fear. I was like, I'm gonna trip. I'm going to trip, and I'm going to take down everyone with me because you're so close. Imagine if you have a selfie stick. Whoa. There's no time for that. We're in a race. You cannot bring sin on the race. Just like the people in charge of the half marathon, God isn't making these rules to bum you out, to rain on the parade of the selfie takers. He's created these boundaries because he knows you got a finish line to reach, and you will never reach it if you're trying to sneak sin along the way. You got to let it go. But that's only one of the things we're told to get rid of. The other thing is a little bit more vague. It just says the weight that slows us down. What is that? If sin is the stuff you can't bring, because it's unsafe. The weight is the stuff you shouldn't bring because it's unwise. Long before I got good at running, I was very good at accessorizing. <laughs> Always have been. So when we sign up for this race, I'm getting a little bit impatient because I'm not able to run very far. So to help myself out, I decided to just go online shopping for a bunch of stuff. And I found some cool stuff. I've never run before, but there's some cool stuff out there, okay, for running. I found this water bottle backpack that had like two straws. I guess if you, either way. I found this belt, you guys, still might buy the belt, but there was this belt. It had two slots for extra water bottles on your hips. And then in the front and the back was a pouch. The front pouch was insulated for cold snacks. And the back was just normal for warm snacks. Water, water, snacks, snacks. Water, sweatband for your earphones, 
so they don't fly around and get tangled in your snacks. And all this stuff, I had a reflector uh, ankle band, even though it was broad daylight, I just wanna make sure. So I have all this stuff in my car, I'm ready. I can't run anywhere yet, but I feel ready. And I show Madison. I'm like, hey, what do you think of my stuff? I'm thinking of getting it. She was like, yeah, dude. I don't think you need it. I was like, what? She's like, you just won't need it. I was like, well, what if I get thirsty? She's like, oh, there's water all the way along the course. I was like, well, what about my snacks? Are they going to keep them cold for me? She said, honestly, like everything you need is going to be on the course, and that stuff is just going to slow you down. Boy, was she right. I was so scared walking up to that starting line that day with nothing, literally nothing. I was like, there's no way. But sure enough, even more than I needed, all the way down the course was stuff, more stuff than you could dream. Better stuff than what I had found. And even stuff I didn't know I would need. There was a woman, God bless her soul, with a poster board slathered in Vaseline. Just start working that out in your mind. So you could run while you're running. You can just take some and use it as necessary. It's for chafing. I didn't know I would need Vaseline. But I needed Vaseline. He's an on time God. Oh, Lord. But it's the same in this race for our lives. In an attempt, like if sin is the stuff we pick up for self-satisfaction, this weight is the stuff we pick up in order to be self-sufficient. Mm, I'm kind of nervous. I don't know. I might need this. I better hold on to this unforgiveness. How else would they know what they did to me? I know fear is heavy, but it kind of keeps me from, from getting into stuff I'm not supposed to get into. I'm just nervous about the future, so I think I'll keep it. If I don't hold on to this bitterness, I'm afraid I'll get hurt again. And God's saying, I marked out this race for you. I know what it's going to take to get you to the finish line. Would you trust me that I've got everything you need and stuff you didn't even know you need? for when things get ugly? Would you throw it off? Around mile four of the marathon, it's really funny. You start to see on the sides all this junk. There's clothes, there's that backpack I really wanted. Water bottles galore. Layers and layers of stuff that people have thrown off. Because it's at that point they realized, this was unnecessary and I'm never gonna make it unless I throw some of this stuff off. Strategy number one, you've got to get rid of some stuff. The race is too long to slow yourself down. It's too long, and it's too important. So we got to get rid of some stuff, but how? How do we do it? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding it's shame. We're running for our lives. And the only way we're going to know what's unnecessary and what's too heavy is if we get a perspective of the finish line. If we get a perspective of what's ahead of us. Not what we can do now, not how, how prepared we feel right now, but for the joy awaiting us. If Jesus can get this image of what's going to come and he can endure the cross... It's a sign that we need to do the same thing. You fix your eyes on Jesus. And all of a sudden, everything is a lot more clear. Like, oh, I don't need this at all. Oh, that was a waste of time. It's too heavy. Let it go. Let's pick up in verse 5. It says, and have you completely forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his daughter? So in the Bible, it says son here but today is for the girlies, okay? So I put daughter everywhere I put son. Have you completely forgotten the word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his daughter? It says, my daughter, do not make light of the Lord's discipline 
and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his daughter. Strategy number two. We're going to have to learn to love discipline in a world that not only hates discipline, but sees discipline as hate. The Bible clearly tells us that he only disciplines us because he loves. I love when Ashley was talking about disciplining her sons. I was like, yeah, I don't have sons. But he only disciplines the ones that he loves. So we've got to learn to love it. Before I asked Madison to help me in my fitness journey, I did make one attempt on my own. And to get motivated, I thought the best thing to do would be to buy a new pair of shoes to get me started, obviously. So I went to the Nike store, and I went up to the section that said running and training, and I just looked and looked and looked, and there before me was the most beautiful pair of shoes I had ever seen. I brought them to show you. Do you love shoes? Me too. Okay, great. Now, I got to tell you that I bought these in 2016. They've seen a lot of life, so don't judge me. Just know that in their prime, whew. okay, you're, I'm kind of nervous because I feel like you can judge me. Okay, here they are. Thank you. All right, this may not look like much to you, but I'm telling you for my style, it's the perfect shoe, okay? I love everything about this shoe, personally. I love the shape of it. I love that it's all monochromatic. It's like one color, but because of the different textures, I'm passionate about this, because of the different textures here, it like gives different tones. See, this wasn't yellow when I got it. It was more white, um, and it didn't have paint on it, but I'm redoing my house. So, in its prime, the shoe was beautiful. And when I got this, I thought, nothing can stop me now. And so on our first run in our Couch to Half Marathon training program, I had these on. And we're running. It was a 15-minute run. We were winded. And we got done. And Madison just so lovingly was like, dude, do you think you'll get any running shoes? <laughs> I'm sorry. What do you think this is? And I was like, dude, I just got these. Like, aren't they so cool? And instead of saying, you're an idiot, she's so nice. She was like, those are so cool. Like a toddler, those are so cool. <laughs> so this is what she said. So why don't you get some running shoes that you don't mind to get messed up and so you don't mess these up? <laughs> and I fell for it because I'm like, another pair of shoes, okay. So she told me to go to Fleet Feet down here on Main Street. Amazing place. So I go to Fleet Feet. I'm going to set these here. I go to Fleet Feet, and I tell the nice lady, I'm training to run a half marathon, and I need shoes. So she puts me on the treadmill. I, had, I wore these shoes to Fleet Feet. She told me to take them off. And I get on the treadmill barefoot, and she records a video of my feet in slow motion. And we watch it together. She's like, watch how your feet hit the ground. That is so messed up. <laughs> it's like, what? Turns out, I run on the outside of my foot. <laughs> I didn't know. So she's like, we've got just the thing. It'll correct that for you. Give me a moment. So I sit down. I put my cool shoes back on. And I'm waiting, and I am anticipating another awesome pair of shoes. So she brings me the box. And to my horror, <laughs> it's the ugliest pair of shoes I have ever seen in my entire life and I brought them to show you. <laughs> okay, disclaimer number two, if you like these shoes, it's okay. I'm not judging you, it's just not for me. You can get them at Fleet Feet. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm way more nervous than I thought I would be about this part. Okay, here they are. So, okay, okay. Don't try to make me feel better. When I saw these, I can't tell you the disappointment. Now, are these the ugliest shoes? No, but remember that this is my style. Okay, so you can see the difference here. 
right? We've got multiple tones. It's giving Malibu Barbie. I don't like that. I don't like the shape of this thing. I don't like anything about it. She could tell I was disappointed. She's like, what do you think? I was like, well, to be honest, you insulted my feet. And now I'm going to look crazy. No, I said, I know what you said about my bad feet. Um, do you have anything that will do this that looks more like this? <laughs> and she laughed like you did, which told me she had had that question quite a bit. She said, here's the thing. Shoes that are made with looks as like the priority are usually not structurally sound at all. She said they go with the trends and the trends change so much they don't invest a lot in the material. She said it's cheaply made and what will happen is it'll wear out your feet, then your knees will start to compensate for your bad feet. Your knees will go, your hips will start to compensate for your bad knees. Then you're back and she, you're gonna be toe up from the flow up. That's what she was trying to say. And I said, well, that's funny, Barbara, because <laughs> these are running shoes. They market these as running shoes. How can they get away with saying these are running shoes if they're gonna kill me if I run in them? She said something that I've never forget. Barbara was on fire this day. She said, well, two things. Big stores like Nike, these are Nike. She said, big stores like Nike know that most people are only going for the look at things. Number one. Number two, most people will never run long enough to find out. I said, Barbara. <laughs> she said, you said you're training for a half marathon, right? I said, yeah. She said, if you have any chance of making it to the finish line, because <laughs> she had seen me run, she said, you're going to have to go with a shoe that will work for you, that will get you there. So I bought them. I don't like it, but I bought them. And in this race of life, we get a choice. We get to be cute, or we can make it to the finish line. That's it. We can try to stay with the trend. We can try to fit in to the culture, whatever it brings at any given moment. Or we can choose discipline, no matter what comes our way, no matter what changes come, we're right here. What is the discipline? It's the word of God. It's God's way. I don't know if you've noticed, but God's way is not trending right now. Not trending. And it won't. It will not. It'll only get worse. And the enemy of your soul is so fine to sell you this right here. He said, yeah, yeah, get out there. Run, girl. Run, girly. But you can do it, and you can stay cute. You can still fit in. You can do what the world is doing. You don't have to stand out so much. You can do this. You, go ahead. Go run. It's fine. This is customizable. It can be whatever you want at any moment. As soon as you don't like this, whoop, get the next one. Something bothers you about the word of God, that's it. Take it out. Doesn't apply to you. This gets to be whatever you want. This is cute Christianity. What the enemy knows is that you're either going to quit running on your own because you weren't that serious anyway, or you will tear yourself apart. Cute isn't going to cut it. If you want to make it to the finish line, we're going to have to choose discipline. We're going to have to choose the unpopular over and over again. The word of God will keep you. The word of God will get you to the finish line. You cannot do it and stay cute. Not anymore. That's over. It's been over. If you're going to make it to the finish, you're going to have to get serious. Remember how I said my foot was messed up and I run on the outside? This shoe is actually higher, the sole of it is higher on the inside than the outside. So that now when I run, I'm running correctly. 
through no change of my own. I'm running correctly. That's what the word of God will do for you. These shoes, they're just waiting to fall apart on you. And I'll tell you, I have not run a single mile in these since that first time. And they look horrible. These literally look the, like the day I got them. God's word isn't going to wear out. It's built out of the stuff you need to get to the finish line. And it will correct. I want to pick up in verse 11. It says, no discipline is enjoyable while it's happening. It's painful. It's not cute. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. Did you know that you can get stronger while you're running? Not if you're trying to be cute, you can't. God's discipline, God's word will strengthen you as you go. And it's the only way we're going to make it. We've got to learn to love discipline. I want to pick up in verse 14. It says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance, his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. It's interesting to me that to this point, all the strategy, it's been like a one-on-one -on -one coaching session. It's like, you need to do this. You need to let go of this. Pick this up. Don't do this. Me and you. And all of a sudden, in verse 14, it changes. The language changes. Watch out for everyone else. See to it that no one. All of a sudden, this is a team effort. Maybe our running isn't just about us. Maybe we need each other. And why does it mention Esau? Who's Esau? Esau is one of these references from Genesis. Is anybody on our Bible engagement journey? Yeah. If you're not on it, please join us. It's incredible. We're actually just a couple weeks away from the story of Jacob and Esau. But let me give you a little bit of background so we know why it's here in our text today. So we got to start. Everybody know Abraham? Father Abraham? So when God made a covenant and a promise with Abraham, he promised to make him the father of many nations. And wrapped up in this promise, this blessing that was bestowed upon Abraham was the, the plan for redemption. Abraham would start a chain of people, of generations that would one day lead to the coming Messiah. That was part of the blessing of the covenant. And it became the right of the firstborn son to inherit so he passed it on to his firstborn son. Does anybody know it? Trivia? Isaac. Isaac. So Isaac receives the blessing. Now Isaac's the next one in the chain that's going to someday lead to Christ's coming. Gets interesting here because Isaac, his wife has twins. Wow. But Esau comes out first. And Jacob is right behind Esau. So close that he's holding on to his heel, his foot. And from that moment, Jacob was always seen as a manipulator trying to get what was Esau's. But Esau had the birthright because he's the firstborn son. And so that means when Isaac dies, not only is he going to get the inheritance, but he's going to receive the blessing. Esau becomes the next chain in the line to Jesus. He gets to be a part of the salvation story of the world. It's a big deal. It's not just a receiving of material things. It's a receiving of a calling that's going to involve the saving of a bunch of people just because he was born first. But Jacob always wanted it. So they grow up. One day Esau's out working in the field. He's working really hard, and he's exhausted. He's so tired. And he comes in, and Jacob is cooking soup. Anybody like soup? Oh. I love soup. 
And Esau's so worn out, and he says, brother, feed me. And Jacob sees this weak moment as an opportunity. And he says, okay, if you'll give me your birthright, I'll give you some soup. And this is what Esau says. So he says, I feel like I'm going to die anyways, so what good is the birthright to me? And he trades. He gives Jacob the birthright for a bowl of soup. Fast forward, Isaac is dying. Guess who gets the blessing? Jacob. That's why we say he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and it was supposed to be Esau. And when Esau figures out what's happened, how Jacob came in and got the blessing, Esau is so mad because now he regrets it. He knows that was not a great trade. He got hungry again soon after that, so what was that all about? And now he's upset, and he wants the blessing. And he's screaming at poor Isaac. <laughs> it's really been had at this point. And he's like, he stole my birthright, and now he has stolen my blessing. Skirt. Pause. Check the tape, Esau. Jacob didn't steal the birthright. It's impossible to steal a birthright. There's nothing Jacob could have done. You gave it up in a moment of weakness for temporary satisfaction. He said, I feel like I'm going to die anyways. He wasn't about to die. He wasn't dying. He was starving. And when we starve, we settle. When we starve, we settle. Have you ever gone to the fridge because you're kind of bored and you open it and you're like, wow, no one's gone grocery shopping. This is the most random array of ingredients, mostly condiments. <laughs> and so you shut it and you keep going. Later on, you come back and you're like, nah. Then later, once you're famished and you're starving and you open up the fridge, you're like, give me everything. And you're having pickles and mayonnaise and there's always some olives. Who buys the olives? Things you never would have done hours earlier now seem enticing to you. And don't we do this with our calling in a moment of weakness? Now you might say, I'm not a firstborn son. I don't have a birthright. When you were born again, when you received the gift of salvation, you became the firstborn of the Most High. God doesn't have any grandkids. You're number one. And when you receive salvation, you receive a blessing and inher an inheritance. Your inheritance is the kingdom of God. It's heaven. It's eternity with the creator. That's your inheritance. But your earthly blessing is a calling that puts you right in the middle of the salvation story. It gives you this authority over generations that are going to come after you. Does it mean you can save your kids? No. But watch what happens with your kids if you refuse to quit running when it gets hard. I'm just telling you, watch what happens. I can't imagine where I would be if my great grandma would to quit running when it got tough and oh, it got tough. I don't know what I would know about God if my nanny and papa were just thrown in the towel when life knocked the wind out of him and it did. I don't know for a lot of people's stories how they would have ended up if my mom and my dad had decided to walk away from the calling on their life because life was unfair and it has been. Jesus saved me. But I know that a huge part of why I know the Lord is because the people who came before me refused to quit running. And today, I don't know how tired you are I imagine you're tired. And I'm not saying your pain isn't real. Jacob or Esau really felt like he was at the end of himself. I know what that feels like. It's not to compare pain and see who has it worse. 
I'm not here to tell you that your pain isn't real. I'm here to tell you that this is way bigger than you and it's bigger than this moment. And you've got to get a perspective of the finish line or else we'll just throw it away for a moment of relief. Like the audience of this letter, they were being squeezed on every side. And the easy thing to do would be either you could go this way and just join the secular world and everything's going to end. It ends immediately. You get your job back. You get to have your friends back. You get to be a normal person in society like that if you'll give it up. You could go this way and you could just go back to your old system in a sacrificial system that's dead and you can try to do it in your own power. You could do that. Your family would have you back in a moment. Your church would have you back in a moment. And I didn't come here to say that your pain isn't real or that what you're experiencing is an intense I came here to say don't you dare give up now we've got to have a perspective of the end because there are some people's salvation stories that's counting on you just keep running just keep running oh, my mom went through a lot but she just she just never stopped running she never stopped. At about mile eight of the half marathon in Los Angeles, the course took us through a neighborhood. And I will never forget, there was this elderly man out in his yard sitting in a wheelchair. And around his neck were, had to be a dozen medals from previous Los Angeles marathons. And he's sitting in a wheelchair and he has this poster board leaned up against his knees. And he's his arm is doing this right here and his poster board said someday you won't be able to do this but today is not that day and when I tell you I was running like this I'm like Madison we can do it I think we can make it it reminds me of the crowd of witnesses that's referenced in the very first verse of our text. It says, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, who are these witnesses? In chapter 11, it lists them all. You should go back and read it. It'll light you on fire. And I'm not going to be able to name them all in order, but just to name a few, it's Abraham, who kept running to the point where he thought he was going to have to sacrifice his own son just because God said to. He just kept running. It mentions Moses who kept running when it was on him to free his people from 400 years of bondage. And he never knew at every single step how it was going to work out, but he just kept running. It mentions Sarah who was promised a child, but every year that passed, it seemed even more impossible. But she kept running. It mentions Rahab and then it goes into like blitz fire and it just starts rattling names off. And it tells you that some of them saw incredible things and some of them saw their prayers answered and some women saw their family members raised from the dead. And there's like a little bit of space. And it says, but some of them never saw the promise on this side of heaven. And it lists all the crazy, horrible things that happened to some of the followers of Christ. The Bible will shoot you straight. For some people, it's just incredible. And for some people, it is not. And we can spend time going, well, why did he get that? Why did she get that? That's what I was praying for. But that's the enemy wanting you to do this right here. And Jesus is saying, right here, right here, why don't you keep running? And this is the crowd of witnesses. It's saying that we're surrounded by, and so many times when we hear this verse, somebody will say, and they're leaning over the banister of heaven, and they're cheering for you. And that is such a nice thought, makes me feel great. But I don't hear them cheering for me. I hear them cheering for Jesus. I can hear the cheer because it's thunderous and it's eternal, but it's not for us, it's for Jesus. Because after all they went through, think about Paul who was shipwrecked and abandoned and beaten and thrown in jail over and over again. He refused to give up. Think about Paul. He makes it to the finish line. He meets his creator. He throws his crown down at the feet of Jesus because he says, 
You were more worth it than I ever imagined. You were more than worth it. There's nothing we can go through, nothing we're gonna face that he won't redeem. It'll be worth it when we get to see him. And the Bible promises that his grace is sufficient for us. So there will not be a day when you can't do this. But sometimes I like to picture Jesus holding a sign. And he's got all kinds of medals around his neck, all of them. And his sign says, someday you won't have to do this. But today is not that day. Today we have to run. I know you're tired, I know it's hard, but today we have to run. Because even if you feel like you're about to die, it's not just about you. Your kids need to see you get knocked down and then back up and keep running. Your spouse needs to see you get knocked down and back up and keep running. There's a generation of young women, young girls who are being raised in darkness that I couldn't have imagined as a child. Adolescent suicide, all time high. Adolescent depression, all time high. Anxiety, all time high. Drug use, all time high. They're hurting themselves. Eating disorders, all time high. Abortion, all time high. Gender dysphoria, gender confusion. It's an all out assault on the next generation. We can't stop now. There's a generation of little girls who need to see older women get up. You gotta get up. We gotta keep running. If we stop, how will they know we're in a race? If they come up on a group of women who are just chilling and sulking and crying, how will they know that they have a race to run? We've gotta run. And I'm not minimizing your pain. process. Maybe you're carrying some weight and today you realize I got to throw it off. I'm not going to make it to the end if I keep trying to carry all this stuff. I want you to get real with God. Help him. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you what do I need to let go of. He'll show you and then throw it off. Don't set it down so you can come back for it later. Throw it off. Yeet. Gotta go. Throw it off. Maybe you've been running but you're trying to straddle the line. You're trying to keep it cute, keep it comfy, and it's tearing you apart. And you couldn't figure out why you were so tired and so run down. And it's because you're doing an impossible thing. It's not gonna work. And today you need to commit to discipline. You need to commit to God's way. Whatever that looks like, you need to commit to God's way. And you know, you know who you are. And maybe you've been out working hard you're doing what you know you're supposed to do. And you're exhausted. You're exhausted and you feel so close to the end of yourself, you don't even see a reason to keep going. You don't see the point anymore. But I want you to come down here and let the Holy Spirit show you your calling. I want you to get a vision of the finish line. I want, to get, I want you to get a vision of generations to come. People you don't even know yet who will cross the finish line because you kept going. Because you didn't quit. I know it's hard. I'm not saying it's not hard. I'm saying he's worth it. I'm saying he's worth it and he's waiting for you. So if the assembly women team will help me out, I brought for you a medal. Everyone will get a medal. The teams are gonna be over here and over here. 
this is what I want us to do. I want you to leave your seat and go this way. You can go around back if you want. I want you to grab a medal, and then I want you to start filling in all down front and around here. I don't want you to put the medal on. We're not finished with our race. It's not time. I want the medal to serve as a glimpse of the finish line, of a joy that's set before you. I want you to hold it, and I want you to let it inspire you to get going, get back up and keep running. And then I want you to lift your hands, and I want you to worship like you already won. That's what I want you to do. I want you to worship with passion like you've crossed the finish line, because this moment of praise will stick in your mind forever. You'll be able to hear the voices of the women who are around you, and in those moments where the enemy's like, hey, you want some soup, you look real tired. You'll hear all of those voices, and you'll say, man, I feel like I'm about to die, but I know I'm not, and I know someday it won't be like this. Today's not that day. I gotta keep going. line are you ready so if you want to go this way go this way grab your medal fill in and let's worship <laughs> 